Hi, so this is Erin Mason, and I am really thrilled to be able to have the chance to present to you all today. Uh, I want to do a special thank you to Dr. Paul Harris of UVA for giving me this opportunity to be your keynote and to share with you some of my own knowledge and expertise around the topic of technology. I do want to let you know that my background is as a school counselor. I was a middle school counselor for 13 years in my home state of Georgia. So shout out to all the middle school counselors in the room. And now I am an associate professor at DePaul University in Chicago. Uh, technology has become not only a personal interest for me, but it's become a, a professional interest in the sense that I'm now researching this particular topic and doing lots of presentations on uh, technology and how we're incorporating technology into the world of school counseling. While you're participating in the presentation today, I do want you to know that I hope you have your devices with you and that you are free to look up things as I'm talking during the presentation. Perhaps look up some of the tools that I'm sharing with you or some of the terms and the other pieces of information that I'm sharing with you. And I hope that you know that you can contact me as well. I'll be sharing my contact information in the presentation. And I'll be back on at the very end of the video today just to say uh, a goodbye and another thank you. So please enjoy the presentation. All right, so let's go ahead and get our presentation started. So on this slide is my contact information. I wanted to share that with you up front in case you want to jot it down. Uh, certainly if you have questions afterwards, things you want to follow up on, ideas you want to chat about, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, this topic of technology is one that's um, been an interest of mine, but it only continues to grow and I really enjoy talking to school counselors about how they're using technology or want to use technology. Uh, so you've got my email address here, ecmm at me.com. Also, you have my Twitter handle, which is at ECM Mason. Uh, Twitter is probably my most favorite tech tool. So if you haven't gotten on Twitter yet, there is a growing school counseling community there, and they're really a great group of people. There's lots of information to gather on Twitter, and I do highly recommend it. So consider getting on Twitter if you haven't yet. Also, here is uh, the link to my website. So the website's called Scope, S-C-O-P-E, and then the web address is uh, scope for scs.com. That stands for scope for school counselors.com. And what I've done on that website, I've been running it for about four years now, and it's gone through several different iterations. Um, but I really do focus on the topic of technology and school counseling. So a lot of what you're seeing here in the presentation is also on scope, but there's a lot more there as well. And uh, I hope you'll check it out, particularly if you have interest in this topic and want to learn some more. So the questions that we'll be considering in this presentation today are the why, the how, and the what of technology. So why you need to use technology, how you know which tools to choose, and then what the popular tools are that are being used. So despite the fact that technology is now pretty pervasive in a lot of schools, uh, it still is something that we're grappling with as a profession. And what I hope this presentation will do is get you kind of thinking outside of uh, the regular uses of technology and really think about what kinds of things you can integrate into your own program. My goal always is that you walk away with one idea. And if you walk away with one idea that you think you can start implementing, then I consider the presentation a success. So hopefully you get some good ideas and you'll start thinking a little bit outside the box. So in terms of the agenda, I'm going to present to you in the next few slides some information, some things that you need to be aware of in terms of thinking about technology. I hope in that process, as I mentioned on the previous slide, you'll start to be kind of reflective about your own use of technology and maybe kind of pushing the envelope on what you, what you can do beyond what you're already doing. And then a large portion of the presentation will actually be me demoing three different tools for you. And I've selected three tools that I wouldn't consider to be mainstream tools. They're a little bit more on the fringe, but they are gaining in popularity. And I am seeing more school counselors starting to uh, kind of get on, on these particular tools. So I'm gonna share those three tools. With, with just an hour, it's, it's hard to present uh, too many tools you know, without 
going in depth enough for you to really feel like you have a, a basic understanding of what they're doing. So I'm going to demo those tools for you. And the way that I'm going to do it is through something called screencasting, where I'm basically recording my movements on these, uh, on these tools websites uh, using something called QuickTime. So it's kind of a combination presentation and uh, hopefully the transitions from one portion to the next will be fairly smooth. So we'll start with this one basic question. Why do you need to use technology? Like I said, we're still kind of grappling with how technology fits into the world of school counseling. And fortunately, there are some documents that we can look to and some, some other sources that we can look to to give us some guidance about why in the world we need to even be concerned about the use of technology. So let's take a look at one of those. So here you have um, the Ask a School Counselor competencies. Now if you're not familiar with this document, this is not the entire document. I've just plucked out a few pieces of it, but you can Google it and see all the different competencies that you should have as a school counselor according to ASCA. But three of those are about technology, so I wanted to point those out to you. The first one says, uses technology effectively and efficiently to plan, organize, implement, and evaluate the comprehensive school counseling program. The second one says, knows, understands, and uses a variety of technology in the delivery of school counseling core curriculum activities. And then the third one uses technology in conducting research and program evaluation. Also, when you look at the ASCA Ethical Code from 2010, there are a couple of uh, bullet points in there as well about technology use. That has more to do with um, ethical decision making around technology and uh, safety of using technology, cyberbullying, those kinds of things. And then ACES, if you're not familiar with that organization, it's the Association of Counselor Educators and Supervisors. So this is a group of your, basically a professional association for your professors who train you that outlines for them technical competencies for counselor education. So things that in your master's program, we should be teaching our students related to technology. So between those three documents, we're already giving some weight to what technology means for our profession. And really in reading through those three bullet points just that are on the screen right there, they're pretty hefty. What they're asking for is a lot. And I think we have to ask ourselves how we're doing uh, with relation to those three particular competencies. Now another reason or another document for us to consider about the why of using technology is just beginning to understand our population, our primary population is students. And this particular slide shows you some recent statistics from a report by the Pew Research Internet Project. It's their 2015 study. And this is a good study to look at because uh, it, it doesn't have a huge sample, but it really points out some very key things about um, technology. In particular, um, what they're highlighting here is that 92% of teens who go online daily, and it's even higher if they have mobile devices, 94%. 72% of um, teens are using technology for gaming purposes. That tends to be more for boys than girls. 71% are using social networking. I was really surprised uh, in their research to learn that Facebook was still a, a very frequently used site by teens. And then probably the most um, significant statistic that they shared in this most recent study is this last one, about 24% of teens who identify that their level of online activity is almost constantly. That's the choice that they selected. And I'll be curious to see how that number changes over time. But certainly just knowing about the technology practices and behaviors of our own students is really important in understanding how we can incorporate technology into our, our uh, roles as school counselors and not to necessarily be threatened by that. I think um, the mindset around technology use is almost as critical as the use itself. And if you approach technology with an open mind and that it can be beneficial and not just have a, um, you know, not just reserve yourself to having a negative attitude about technology, uh, then you're going to be far more, far more likely to find it useful in your position.
And then finally, you know, just knowing that this is what our students are using and doing on a daily basis. And I don't know that we're ever going to go away from this. Uh, I think technology is here to stay. And so our students are really beginning to show us, you know, not only the use of technology, but the ways in which it's becoming part of their day-to-day -day lives. And I really do believe that the students themselves can almost be our teachers around how technology is incorporated into our programs. Not only can they show us what tools to use and what things that they like to, to have on their own devices, but they can really help us to see how technology can be useful for us as well. So consider that your students are, in many cases, your experts. The next question then is, how do I know which tool to use? And this is a common one that I hear from many, many school counselors is, you know, Aaron, there's just so many tools out there and it's always changing and how do I possibly keep up? And this is one that's been, uh, you know, that I've turned over in my head many, many, many times and really tried to understand in a different way now than I used to. Because what I found has happened is that many school counselors use something because they know somebody else who's using it, or they know several people who are using it. So they kind of just adopt it almost like by peer pressure. And I think that's actually the wrong way to go about it. It doesn't mean that word of mouth isn't a strong uh, influence when it comes to deciding what technology you're gonna use. But a big part of using technology is understanding that your school may be very different from someone else's school, and your role as a school counselor may be different from theirs. And so it's not so much about just using the newest, shiniest, you know, freshest thing out there, but really figuring out what it is that you need to use that will work for you and that will work in your particular setting. So I'm going to give you kind of a new framework to think about how to figure out which tools to use. So the framework is this, it's very simple, but it's identify a problem first and then identify the tool. So this has come around to me because of the many conversations that I've had with school counselors as I've done research on this topic. And what I found is that, as I said earlier, many school counselors are using something because it's, it's what they, they've heard about or they've gone to a professional development and they've learned about it but they haven't really done the initial work to figure out, okay, what problem do I have that technology could potentially solve? So for example, if your problem is around communication with staff, students, or families, and you wanna reach more of them, then investigate the tools that you think will address that problem. Rather than starting with the tool first, start with the problem first. It might be, organizing and streamlining your work. Maybe you need a better way to organize your files or to share your files. Um, maybe you need a better way to engage students in the classroom. Your old presentations are just not cutting it anymore. So figure out what the problem is first and then try to figure out the tool rather than doing it the other way around. Another way of kind of taking this even to the next level is to think about the ask a model. And if you can put that problem that you have, whether it's communication or organization or engagement or something else, those are just three ideas, three samples, think about where it fits into the ask a model when you think about the different components of the ask a model. Is it something that's about the foundation? Is it about management, delivery, or accountability? So for example, you may decide that you want to have better communication and organization with your advisory council. If that's the case, then look at the management section and figure out what your problem is. Maybe it's sharing of documents. Maybe it's communicating things. And work to figure out what tools might fit into that management section and then how you're going to implement it. I think it's really important for school counselors to understand that they don't need to, need to use a lot of different tools they need to use a few tools that will really be effective and helpful for them. So that brings us to the tools question. What are the popular tools being used? Well, there are a number of them out there. We tend to see that tools start with teachers. They're, they're targeted at education and they're targeted specifically at teachers. And then what happens is over time, 
uh, they tend to filter out to other groups like school counselors. So many of the tools that are really popular are fairly mainstream at this point. And some have really, you know, stuck and that's why the, they're mainstream is because when they come out, even when they're new, over time they develop, they get better, and people use them more frequently and they, use, they incorporate them into their day-to-day -day work. There are other tools out there who kind of come and go. They last for a very short period of time and they just kind of drop off and you might never even hear about them. So let's take a look at what the popular tools are. <clears throat> so these are some of the more well-known and popular tools. And certainly um, there are others that are not necessarily on this list, but this is just from my own research and my own conversations with school counselors. Of course, Google is huge and Google kind of has the market share on lots of different things. Uh, many people are using all of the Google tools, including Calendar, Drive, Forms, slides, there are other things out there, and Google is always trying to generate more tools. So I do feel like Google is a good first place to go. Many uh, school districts have adopted Google as their primary operating platform, uh, so a lot of things are already integrated. So Google certainly is a good one to start with, and it's one that many, many people are using. Prezi is a presentation tool. You might be familiar with it. It's kind of like PowerPoint, but has a lot more movement to it. Uh, Remind is a text messaging based service that I see lots and lots of school counselors starting to use uh, if they haven't been already. And it just allows them to reach their students on their cell phones. But the great thing about it is if you, if you don't want to, um, it can be just one way messaging. So it could just be for announcements and reminders rather than being like a two-way conversation. There are features that you can turn on and off around that. And then YouTube is something that a lot of people use in classroom guidance, in small groups. So these are the ones that I would say are well known and popular. Let's look at some that are more gaining popularity. So these are tools that, like I said, they're not necessarily mainstream, they're not being used by everybody, but they're tools out there that can serve a purpose for school counselors. You might be familiar with some of them. If you're not, you're in luck because I'm gonna show you these three tools. And there are more that I could add to this list. You'll find a lot more of them on Scope if you're kind of wanting to know about more tools and other tools. But the three that I'm gonna highlight for you today are Live Binders, Poll Everywhere, and s'more. So let's go ahead and get started with our screencasts. So now we're taking a look at Live Binders, L I B E B I N D E R S, at livebinders.com. Live Binders is a tool to help you with your organization. Uh, for those of you that were like me and you had those three or four inch plastic and cardboard binders that sat on your shelf and often if they took a lot of abuse the plastic would start to come off and the rings would start to come out of the middle because they just couldn't hold up. So this is like having one of those but online and what's great about it is you can really update information as you need to without going through the hassle of having to punch in um, uh, holes in each page, as I can recall doing. So we're in my Live Binders account, and I'm going to show you an example of a Live Binder uh, that I have used and that gets a lot of use in our school counseling program. And then I'm going to show you some examples of school counselors and their binders um, so that you can get a sense of what it can be used for. So this is one that I think is a tool that's really practical and really useful for school counselors. And what I like about it is uh, you can use the binder just exclusively to you so you can keep it private. So you'll see down here uh, that there are private binders, public binders, collaborative binders, so I can share a binder with someone else and work on it together so that you can have binders that really are for your own private use and organization, but you can also have ones that are more public to be able to share resources. So I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to show you one of our binders to get a sense of what it could look like if it's a public binder. <clears throat> Excuse me. So 
you'll notice here a lot of DePaul logos because that's what we're using for the covers of our binders. But you'll see, you know, even on my page that they just look like little mini binders. And you'll see this one is private. It's got that little tab up there. Uh, and creating them is very easy. You just click on new binder, start to name it, you know, add tabs. So let's take a look at a binder so you get a better sense of what it looks like. So I'm going to click on this binder here. And this is the binder that is basically the student handbook for our graduate students in our counseling program. So that includes school counseling, but then some other tracks as well. And this is what the basic layout of a binder looks like. And you'll see in this case, it's fairly straightforward. Um, it's not particularly colorful, um, but we just want to keep it kind of streamlined. And so the way that binders are set up in live binders is that you have all of these kind of parent tabs and then with each one when I click on it so we're on this welcome to CSL which is the acronym for our program and then it has all these sub tabs so live binders works on this kind of organizational system of tabs and sub tabs what's great about live binders though is that I can add pretty much any kind of document in here I can link to a website which is what you're seeing on this first on this screen uh, but I can add in uh, a PDF, I can add in uh, a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet, and I'm going to show you some different examples. But just understand that similar to like you would have those plastic dividers in your actual notebook, you have um, these tabs and sub tabs here. So what you're seeing on this first page is a good example of how you can link in a website. And so I put that in here, and this is a website that we use to communicate with students. It's basically on Blogger and we just, it's how we communicate job opportunities and program information, all that kind of stuff. But I've taken that link and then been able to just drop it into this particular tab so that every time students come here, the first thing that they see is our blog and the most current information. So that's an example of how you can embed a, a website and I'll show you some others as well. If I go to the coursework tab, I can show you how you can also add in a, a document. So in this case, it's an upload of a spreadsheet, a program plan, and but I get the view there of the actual spreadsheet. What Alive Binders allows you to do is to store any documents that you're using in the live binder system so that you can go in and you can add them into these tabs. Now if I go to professional practice which is basically internship for us then I can show you how we have another PDF here of our internship handbook and students can scroll through the whole thing and read all of it right here in the Live Binders site. So you've seen examples of how we can upload documents as well as websites. And then sometimes, um, here's another example of um, a spreadsheet that we've added in. It does take a, a couple of seconds for it to load sometimes. There it goes. Uh, so this is a list of, of sites that we recommend that students take a look at for potential internships. So I've just been able to add that one in directly because I use the link from a Google spreadsheet. So that's another way to do it. So I can add in the actual spreadsheet, particularly if it's not going to change a lot. But if I want something that's more alive and that is going to change, I might want to put in uh, a link from uh, a Google spreadsheet. So I can add that in here. And then we also also have just pages that are just basically um, text. This is another website page, um, but we do have we do have pages that are just basic text too. So for example, this is a page about advising, just has a little bit of text, and then we've made each of these links to the advisors uh, clickable, so that when students click on it, it just opens up in their email. So the nice thing about Live Binders is that you can use it in this kind of public way where people can take advantage of what's here. And for us, it's been very helpful with our graduate students. But then I can also share it 
uh, via email, Twitter, Facebook, all the social media kinds of things. I can embed it, which I've sometimes done in our in websites, uh, particularly for our courses, so that students have easy access to this this uh, student handbook when they go to, to to their course website. The other thing that I can do too is um, let's see, I was looking for it up here. Gets here. Let's see. There is a presenting option. Um, this is how I edit. So let me come back to the presenting option in just a second. So if I go into the editing side of a, a binder, then this is what it looks like. It gives me these this kind of menu up at the top. And what it allows me to do is to add, add tabs, add those sub tabs. Uh, to move tabs so that if I need to move things left or right, I can do that. To add content. Now this is where if you want to add files, then you would go to My Files and it will store all of the files that you want to include in your binders. If you wanted to add a website, you do that here. Pretty much anything that you want to add to a page, you would add through here. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. It does take a little bit of just playing around with to get used to it. Uh, here's the play feature um, or the present feature that I was talking about. So if you wanted to do a presentation and show people your live binder, and I've done that in some cases where the live binder itself is the presentation because I'm sharing a lot of resources, then I can go into this presentation mode and, and share the live binder that way. Uh, you can also just do it, as I've been doing it here, straight through the website, and it makes a pretty good presentation tool. So that's a little bit about live binders, and I probably should uh, point out to you, go back to my home page here, and tell you that when you're in the site itself, the other benefit of live binders is that you can search any topic. So you can, if you wanted to search for social emotional learning or you wanted to search for college admissions counseling, you can search any topic. I'm going to show you what happens when you do that in just a second. The other thing that's nice is that you can save binders that you find from other people to your own shelf. So for example, I have a school counseling shelf and I've been able to save all of these binders, which prove to be good examples of how school counselors are using live binders. Um, I've got a technology shelf as well. Um, and again, I've got private binders, uh, public binders, and then collaborative binders. And for example, if I wanted to, uh, if I go back to my home page here and I wanted to share this particular binder, then I could, again, I could go through those options, but if I wanted it to be collaborative, then I go under Options for the binder, and I click Collaborate, and then I can add in or remove my collaborators. In this case, I have several different collaborators, but some of them are no longer here, so I can actually do that right now, and I can remove them. And then I just have those two. So it's very easy to, to add your collaborators as well. Okay, so that's the basics of live binders and gives you kind of an introduction. What I want to do is go over here and I pulled up this tab where I did a search on school counseling. I just clicked in that search bar and typed school counseling and I get all of these binders uh, created by other people on the topic of school counseling. So I wanted to show you a particular binder just so you have an example of how it looks for a school counselor. And I'm going to pick Mary Beth McCormick because she's uh, a Virginia school counselor and show you what her binder looks like. So the first thing that probably strikes you is how colorful it is compared to my very safe and boring gray tab. So obviously you can color code things and if you're in elementary school that may have certain appeal to you, but you can see that she's got kind of a um, an all-encompassing binder that includes a lot of different things. 
uh, for this particular first page, she's just put in a website. But I like that she has uh, parent resources. And what she has here are multiple uh, websites. So she's just created all these different tabs of other websites that parents can go to. Uh, she's done the same thing for staff resources. Um, she's got Virginia School Counseling Association in here. And so she's got sub tabs here, which would take me to different things. <clears throat> uh, here's her presentation that she did. Uh, but then she's also got things on, on different topics, uh, grief, for example. And she's got some tabs in here. And sometimes it'll populate a picture if it's got a website there. If not, then you may need to click on the, the sub tab for it. So there's, there's a website that just populates itself right in the tab there. But anyway, this is, this is one way to do it. And I think in Mary Beth's case, she's, she's using it for multiple things. But what I've seen other school counselors do, and I'll just click back to this page, is they have it just for their, uh, for their classroom guidance lessons. Or they have it just for um, their uh, uh, for their small group counseling. So you can you can have multiple binders for multiple things. So speaking of that, I want to show you Susan. Susan is a Canadian school counselor. She's in a high school setting, but she has probably more binders than I've ever met of anybody I've ever met. So she has multiple binders on. Just so many different topics, career, planning, mindfulness, test anxiety, um, <clears throat> resources, tech tools, all different kinds of things. So if you're looking for somebody who's got a binder on multiple topics, you can take a look at Susan. Uh, and again, you can search anything. So if I did social, if I did, a, let's do the right, ask a language, personal social, no, social emotional now, right? social emotional then it just does a search and I've got all of these different options so not only is live binders a great uh, place for you to create your own binder so that you can organize yourself but it's also a great place to find resources that other people have collected uh, so hopefully you can make use of live binder so here we're looking at a tool called Poll Everywhere, P-O-L-L-E-V-E-R-Y-W-H-E-R-E. -E -E -E. And the website is polleverywhere.com. So Poll Everywhere, as the website says, is a tool for engagement. Uh, it's a tool that you can use as a pre and post test when you're doing classroom guidance. It's a tool that you can use for parent or family orientations or meetings, and it's a tool that you could use for staff training as well. Uh, I particularly like to use it in some of my courses, but I mainly use it when I'm doing presentations or trainings, just as a way to engage my audience in using technology. But there are lots of different uses, and the other thing that you can do with Poll Everywhere is if you want to collect some ongoing data, then you can embed a poll in a website and collect that data uh, as well. So people just log on to the website, they see the poll and they will hopefully participate. So what you're seeing here on the Poll Everywhere page is exactly that. They have this poll here about which presentation software or application do you tend to use. And this is a good demonstration of what a Poll Everywhere poll looks like and how it works. Now the key thing about Poll Everywhere is that it does require internet access or the use of a digital device like a cell phone or a tablet in order for it to work. So depending upon what your school policies are around having devices and whether or not students have them is something that's critical to the use of Poll Everywhere. But I do find it a very engaging tool and it has kind of a wow factor that hopefully I'll be able to show you that really, um, that really does, does speak to people when they participate in it. So as you can see from this example that they have on their website, uh, you can use this option where it says respond at pollEverywhere.com. 
that would be in the case of going into a computer lab type of situation and you can just have everybody log on and participate in the poll on their computers. Otherwise, most people are, if they're out in the audience and you're, you have this up on screen, then they're going to use their cell phones or their tablets to participate. But what happens when they respond, and hopefully you'll see this when I demonstrate it for you in a minute, is that all the live responses, they change as they're coming in. And it's pretty cool to see that happen and very engaging. So Poll Everywhere is a free tool, although like many others, it also has a pro upgrade that gives you more features. I find that what it offers for free is really I can make use of with relatively no problem. The limitation is that you can only have 40 people participating in that particular in any particular poll the way that i get around that sometimes when i have larger groups is either one of two things either it becomes kind of a fun race to see who can get their responses in most quickly or you can create multiple sets of the same question but the polls themselves are unique and then you can just have um, different groups respond to different questions even though you're asking the same thing basically just duplicate the questions so I'm going to go over to my poll everywhere account and just show you what it looks like from the creation and the editing side so what you're seeing here are some of the polls that I've used um, over the past um, in the past and you'll you're seeing that they're also grouped together which is helpful and so you can uh, just select them and group them together or if you don't want them grouped together, you can ungroup them just by clicking, you know, the checkbox. Uh, and what grouping does is it helps you to keep things together by class or by grade level or by topic or event so that you don't get confused about which polls go with which thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other nice thing is that you can also, it's a little bit of extra work but you can download your polls as slides. So for example, I have this particular one checked. And when I click on download poll slides, it generates a PowerPoint for me to open. And the extra work that you have to do here is that you do have to install the Poll Everywhere app on your computer. There's no charge for that, but it, it will allow you to do the poll straight from a PowerPoint source. Now, I don't particularly feel the need to do that. And often when I'm using a poll as part of a presentation, I just come here to the Poll Everywhere website and then jump out of my presentation. Or I might have the poll sometimes as kind of a um, an interactive thing to do as people are coming in. So you can use the PowerPoint option. Again, it's a little bit of extra work and I think it works just as well if you're there that you can just jump over to the Poll Everywhere page. So that's the grouping and I can click these up so you can kind of see uh, how, they're, how they change. So I want to show you just a couple of um, sample polls that I've done so you can see what they look like and then I'm going to try to demonstrate one for you by participating myself so you get kind of that wow factor. Uh, so for example, one of the things that I have done polls around is our, our questions related to technology. So this particular one, uh, what's your comfort level about technology? So when I open up the poll and get ready to present it, it looks like this. And what you can see is that I've had what, about 14, 12 or 13 people participate in this poll. And if I want to look at it in the big version, I could do that. Yep, so three here, nine there, and one there. So what happens when you're, when you're participating is all of this is live. So you're watching these bar graphs grow and shrink based on people's responses. And it's really very cool. Right now the poll is locked so that I'm not accepting any random responses, which you can do. Um, and then these little buttons over here, so we're still kind of in the editing side of, of the poll. This would allow me to unlock the poll. So if I wanted to start collecting responses, I could do that. And I'll show you how that works when I do the demo. I can also make it inactive on my Poll Everywhere page, that page that, uh, that lists all of the polls there, so that people aren't going in and, and trying to add data or um, so you're just sort of securing your data with those types of things. If I wanted to do some things with the visual settings, I can do that here. I generally tend to keep things pretty straightforward, but if you want to put in fancy backgrounds and 
uh, change colors and that sort of thing. You can do that with your visual settings. Uh, you can also clear all the poll results. So if I wanted to set this back to zero, I would simply click here. And now everything is reset. Uh, and then this allows me to look at it in full screen view. What you'll notice about each poll is that there are two options that I talked about a little bit earlier. One is that they can use the Poll Everywhere website with your kind of specific information. That's the Aaron Mason 133. It connects to my Poll Everywhere site. I can use that, and again, that's good for a computer lab type of setting. Or what most people will probably do is uh, they'll do the, the text version and I'll show you they're using their cell phones or their tablets and I'll show you how that works. I haven't tried the Twitter one um, to see if that works, um, but essentially that, that is another option. Now the other thing to know is that when you create your poll, you have different options about what your data is going to look like. So I just showed you a basic one that was bar graphs, but here's another version. And this is called a word cloud version. So what it does is when people respond to the poll, instead of typing in a number or a letter that respond, that corresponds to their answer, they're typing in an actual word. And what Poll Everywhere does is it creates like a wordle or a word cloud. And so the answer that comes in that's the most popular is the one that's bigger. So you'll see in this case, it's the word computer. So it's just another way to represent your data. And if you're asking something that's more open-ended, this may be the option that you want to choose. So how do I create a poll? Very, very simple. So I simply go over here and click Create Poll, and I type in my question. So you want to make sure that as you're typing in questions, you're thinking about something that's fairly straightforward, not too complicated, not too long. And then when I create it, well, You'll see when I start typing in my question, then it gives me the option of what kind of response uh, people can put in. So it can be multiple choice, and I can add as many answers as I want here. Uh, or it can be open-ended, and that's where that word cloud came into play. So I've got these different sort of visual options for what that looks like. Now, I haven't used either the QA brainstorm or the clickable image. Um, options. I've really just stuck to either multiple choice or open-ended. But then you simply create your poll and it's there in your in your lineup. Uh, and it, show, it will show up here. So that's essentially how you, and there, there are great tutorials here about how to create polls. Um, you can also find some things on YouTube. So creating a poll is really not all that difficult. And when you are able to present the poll, that's where all the magic happens. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to open a poll that I used as part of a quiz question for class and show you uh, how it will work. So let me make sure everything is unlocked. Yep, so everything's unlocked. Oops, there we go. So let me show you uh, how this actually works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a new text message on my phone. And in the to button, I'm going to type in that number there that's 37607. So your Poll Everywhere account kind of has like a phone number that's attached to it. And that's what that number is for my particular account. And then to join this actual poll, I need to basically connect with with the poll first before I can put in my answer. So I'm going to type in that text there that says Aaron Mason 133. And when you have a more a pro account, you can kind of change some of these settings so they are things that make a little bit more sense. So when I click send, then I get a message back from Poll Everywhere that says I've joined the session. So that means I'm good to go with entering in my response. So the question is the national guidelines used to create your school counseling curriculum are called what? And we're specifically here talking about curriculum, not program. So the answer is our new mindsets and behaviors, which has the letter C attached to it. So in that same text message, I'm gonna type in C and click send. And then you see the C, so that's my response there. You see that pop out. So it gives you an idea about what it's like when you 
enter in a response. And then if obviously if you're having multiple people responding, again, those, um, those bar graphs jump in and out as the numbers are being calculated. So that's a little bit about Poll Everywhere, and I hope that you can find some practical uses for it in your program. All right, so we're moving on to S'more, S-M-O-R-E, just like the uh, treat that some of us love with graham crackers, chocolate, and marshmallows. Although, unfortunately, none of those are involved in uh, this presentation. Uh, so we're at s'more.com, S-M-O-R-E.com. And S'more is a tool to help you with communication. Uh, so many of you may be using a tool like Microsoft Publisher, Microsoft Word, even PowerPoint to create flyers or newsletters. And S'more is just another option to consider. Uh, it's, it's a newsletter flyer tool. What I particularly like about S'more though is it has a lot of more modern kind of fresh designs to it. So if you're looking to kind of kick things up a notch, S'more might be a tool that you want to take a look at. Now, like some of the other tools that I show you, S'more is also free, but there is a pro version as well if you want some additional features. Some schools that I know of have actually purchased pro accounts for the whole school, which allows everybody in the building to take advantage of those pro features. And I'll talk about what a couple of those are as we go along. Uh, but this is S'more and we're in my account. So what I'm going to be doing is showing you one of my own flyers just so you understand the basics of how S'more works and show you how to start a new flyer as well. And then lastly, I'm going to show you a, uh, a flyer or a newsletter rather that was created by a middle school counselor who uses S'more quite a bit. And I just want to highlight one of hers so that you get an idea about how it might work as a newsletter, particularly as a school counselor. So I'm going to go over here to your flyers and pull up all of my flyers. And I've used S'more quite a bit. You'll see the flyers here on the left hand side kind of gives you just an overview of what they look like. But I'm going to stop on this one uh, called Technology for School Counselors. This was an event that I did last spring in Georgia, my hometown, thus the, uh, the peaches in the background. And this is the what it looks like from your side. Uh, you'll notice here that there's a preview button. I can click on that. And this is what it looks like from the viewer side. So if someone gets the link to your flyer or your newsletter, it, this is what they see. And it's very similar, as you can see, from what it looks like from your side. Yours just has a few more buttons. So if we look at the flyer itself, you see how this is a pretty basic setup. And I was using a template for an event, which I'll show you when you start a new flyer, how it, it brings up all of these different templates that you can work from. Uh, so you'll notice that I've got uh, obviously a title, I've got some information about the event. You can put in links here, which is nice because that can take you, take people to some other site that you want them to look at. Uh, and then it puts in the event information in a way that's very clear, easy to read, easy to see. And then I particularly like that it has an option for getting directions to the location of the event. I think that's a nice feature. And then at the bottom, it's just got bio information and contact information, uh, which is a nice thing to do. And then you, you also see that you can add in pictures. So it's very intuitive, it's very user-friendly, and this is just a very basic flyer uh, that I created. You can go more complicated than this, and when I show you the newsletter, you'll see how it's longer, it has more content in it, but it's really up to you to figure out what you want to use it for and how much content you want to include. So a few other things while we're on this page. One is to show you how you can share your flyers and newsletters. You obviously have these social media buttons up here that make it easy to share it that way. Uh, if you wanted to put your flyer on a website, you can grab this embed code and then it becomes a visual uh, on your website. So that's a nice feature to have and you can use it with some other tools like if you're using a tool like Live Binders um, or something like that then you can use the embed code and again have that nice visual of your flyer. Uh, the thing that I think most school counselors are using more for is for sending out newsletters or events and an easy way for them to do that is to share with email. Uh, so many schools that I know, you know, the school counselor will have uh, a distribution list and that might be your advisory council. It could be 
grade level, it could be a club, it could be um, honor society, or you know, it could be parents as well or staff. So it really depends uh, upon the group that you're targeting. But if you have an email distribution list, then all you have to do is click this and then you can drop all of those emails in. So it's an easy way to send uh, your newsletter or your flyer via email. Now one of the things to notice is that with the free account, you're limited to a monthly allowance of 200 emails. If you wanted that pro upgrade, then it's unlimited. So you can see this is one of the reasons why schools have purchased a pro account for the entire school and then everybody can take advantage of the pro feature. So that's something to consider. But if you're just getting started with S'more and you kind of want to try it out on your own, you're not really thinking that anybody else is going to be using it, then just go with the, the free account and I think you can figure out a way for it to work for you. And I'll show you some, some ways that I've gotten around that too. So every, uh, every flyer or newsletter that you create in S'more has its own unique link. So when you share to Facebook or Twitter uh, or an email, that's what you're sending people to is this unique link. So they click on the link and then they see your flyer. So it's intended to be used uh, and distributed digitally, you know, through the internet. But I do want to point out that sometimes you just want the printed version because sometimes that's what you need and you can print from S'more. So if I go to the print button here, then I can click on that. It's going to generate a, a view of what it looks like. And the key here is knowing how long you want your printed document to be. So in the case of this flyer, I can see that it's telling me it's two pages, but I can already tell all of my content is fitting on this one page. And so that second page is just a blank page. So you can see just from looking at this that if I print this up, this is a nice looking flyer. Uh, it's a little bit more modern, a little bit fresher looking, and I could print that up and have hard copies available. The other thing that I sometimes do is I create a PDF of it. And so I could do that here uh, or open the PDF in preview and I can save it as a PDF version. When I do that, then I can put the PDF into an email and even though I'm not getting the connected, I'm not getting it connected to that link that it has, it allows me to distribute it to more people. And it just is an image that pops up uh, in that email. And so it's nice to open that email and then the flyer is right there. So you can use a PDF version if you feel like you can't, uh, you need to distribute to more than 200 people. So that's just, a, I just wanted to point that out to you because a lot of people still do like to be able to print their things. Now if you're okay with multiple pages and you have a newsletter, then you'll see that you know you might you might have to have multiple pages, but if you're okay with that and copy front and back, then that might serve your purpose as well. The last thing that I want to show you here is the analytics. And so this is something that is only generated if you're using that link. So if you're driving people to the flyer or the newsletter online, then what Smore does is it tracks the views. And you can see in this case, there have been 51 views of this particular flyer. And I can click on show analytics and I get a little bit more detail. It tells me what source it's coming from. It tells me how long people are spending looking at it. Uh, and then some other information as well. One of the other pro features of S'more is that you can do RSVPs. Uh, so that's something that you might want to think about too, if it's worth it for you to have the RSVP feature for a little extra money. The other thing that's nice and kind of interesting, I think, about the views is that it'll tell me where they're coming from. So you can see from this map that, you know, most things are coming from the U.S., but I've got this one over here in China and, um, you know, a couple here like in South America. Uh, so that's kind of interesting too, is just to see where people are, are getting uh, their links and, and where they're coming from. Uh, so that's, that's a basic s'more. Uh, what I want to do is go back to the main page and just show you what happens when you click start a new flyer. And you get this, which is basically gives you six different templates to start from. The one that I was showing you was an event template. 
but you'll see there's one here for news bulletin, uh, business sale, a class, uh, and then other. And I often use either other or start from blank, which is an option because I'm not really sure exactly what components I want to add, but all the components are easy to add when you are starting from scratch. So this is what happens when I start from scratch. And what you'll see down at the bottom is if I want to add text, I click here. If I want to add a picture. So again, it's very user friendly. And one of the things that you'll see on the newsletter, what I'm about to show you is you can add forms. So if you're a big fan of Google Forms, you can add a link to a Google Form in here and make that as part of your either your RSVP or if you're gathering data. Um, so think about all the potential uses for S'more if you're also adding in a form. So all these things are really easy to add. All right, so I'm going to skip over to Carol Miller's page. Carol Miller is a middle school counselor in New York, and she's been using S'more. She was kind of what I would consider one of those early adopters. So this is a newsletter for her. So you're going to see it looks very different from the flyer of mine that I just showed you. She's got lots of views, 5,000 views. Um, but what you see in the newsletter uh, are various things. You see she's got some text, pictures. Uh, obviously, she's got a little video here, which is just coming straight from YouTube. So it's just easy to put that in. Of course, you want to remember that if you're sharing uh, pictures of your students or videos of your students, that you want to have photo privileges for those uh, so that you don't get in trouble. Uh, and then you'll see here, this is a picture of a worksheet that she's using. Uh, this is the Google form that I was mentioning earlier. So she's obviously been able to just plop that in and then people can provide data um, that maybe she's collecting. Uh, and then it's just easy to see how there's text, there's pictures, there's video. You can make the pictures different sizes. Um, some more photos and text, another video. And then at the end, she has her contact information. Um, so this is an example of a newsletter, and I think it's a good example. But obviously this is, might not be something that I would print, right? Because it would have too many pages to it. But it's got a lot of, it's a, it's a great way to really share with people what you're doing in your program and to do it in a way that is engaging and visual and interactive. You know, I can click on the, the video, I can click on the, um, the form to fill out, and that just makes it far more interactive than simply getting a piece of paper. So that's a, an introduction to S'more, and I hope you will consider using it in your program. All right, it's me again, and I do just want to end this uh, presentation by saying thank you to all of you for um, your participation in this summit. I hope you enjoy and have a great rest of the day. In the meantime, please do check out Scope or feel free to contact me if you'd like to follow up on any questions. Uh, or share ideas um, about your own use of technology. But again, it has been my pleasure, and I wish you all the very best in the rest of this school year. Take care.